Good afternoon. We are so pleased to have you all here with us to begin our new seminar season. We all know that our political system isn't working as it should right now. Extreme polarization and congressional dysfunction are particular problems. Our speaker, Norm Ornstein, is just the right person to explain how we got to this point and to give us some thoughts on what we might do about it. He and his co-author Thomas Mann, who have 70, that's seven zero years between them, of studying Congress and our political system, wrote the book, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, in 2012. They updated it in 2016 with a new preface, afterword, and title, It's Even Worse Than It Was. You'll, you'll have seen his formal biography in your program, including his work with the American Enterprise Institute and the Atlantic Magazine, and his contributions to congressional working groups. I'm going to add briefly to that by giving you a few quotes from reviewers of the 2012 book that emphasize what a noted scholar Dr. Ornstein is and why we should think hard about what he has to say. From the Boston Globe, Mann and Ornstein are widely respected, even-keeled, non-polemical observers who have studied the ways of Washington for decades, so their observations should carry significant weight with serious people. The Weekly Standard, Mann and Ornstein are the deans of the Beltway establishment, at least its intellectual wing. <laughs> Take that <laughs> for what you wish. Uh, the New York Times Book Review, they are considered straight shooters, so their key argument is striking. The Economist, they are highly respected analysts. Coming from them, the claim that the American system is even worse than it looks deserves to be taken with the utmost seriousness. Bloomberg News, they propose solutions. Many are well-reasoned, a few are downright creative. You might want to ask him about that if he doesn't cover that in his talk. Just last Friday, a column in the New York Times noted that when their book was first published in 2012, it was applauded by many, but ignored or vilified by many of the political and media figures that they blamed for the growing dysfunction. Since then, their analyses and predictions have been proved right. Things have gotten even worse. Now it's time to listen. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ornstein. Thank you, Kate, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I have to make one correction, and believe me, I don't want to make it. Tom and I actually have 90 years, uh, not 70. <laughs> uh, I'm touched by uh, all of you being here and, uh, of course, moved by this magnificent setting. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really great to be out here in Colorado, away from the intellectual wing of the Beltway uh, establishment. Uh, and thank you, Bob and Kate, for mentioning the book, which does make a great holiday gift. Uh, so. <laughs> so our uh, world has been turned upside down in politics, of course, since Donald Trump threw his hair into the presidential <laughs> ring. And the question I get asked all the time, including here before we started, is uh, what happens if Trump becomes president? And my answer is don't worry too much. If he becomes president, Within a couple of months, he'll leave us for a younger country. <laughs> so, of course, we're getting close. Uh, we have uh, conventions uh, starting very, very shortly. We're uh, down, uh, uh, really, to the uh, beginning of the fall campaign. And I've been actually thinking back a little bit not with a whole lot of nostalgia, about uh, the candidates who've fallen by the wayside. Um, Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side is now apparently going to be making an appearance right before we know it with Hillary Clinton, uh, basically acknowledging that it's over. Uh, Bernie, uh, of course, uh, was a fairly obscure figure, uh, despite all of his years of service in Congress, and now has become this national celebrity. He uh, skyrocketed to prominence, and it even reached a point where Ben and Jerry's named an ice cream after him. It was $3.99 a pint, and the taxes were $200 million. So. We had Lincoln Chafee on the Democratic side. Remember poor Lincoln? I really felt sorry for Chafee. Link 
tried to be the Bernie Sanders of this campaign. And of course, Bernie had this memorable slogan, feel the burn. But when Link tried, feel the chafe. <laughs> now, I kind of identified with it, but apparently not, not, not a whole lot of others. And then, of course, we had 17 on the Republican side. And we started with so many people thinking that it would be Jeb Bush, and of course, Bush had the family tradition. We had Bush 41, we had Bush 43. He was gonna be Bush 45, as they say in the family, no child left behind. Uh, <laughs> but it didn't quite work out. We had Ben Carson, uh, who after a debate, uh, uh, had people saying no child left awake. Uh, <laughs> we had Rick Perry, my sort of favorite, uh, you know, from two campaigns, and I remember when uh, my favorite moment, the last time uh, Rick uh, Perry ran, was when he was asked what he would do about the West Bank, and he said he'd bring back free checking. Uh, <laughs> and as a Republican consultant said to me after that, if he were a child, he'd be left behind. So, and we had Rand Paul, of course, uh, you know, Paul, a, a libertarian, for uh, legalization of drugs, legalization of prostitution. I really was sad when he was forced to drop out of the campaign. I just wanted to be at the victory party. And, <laughs> and now, uh, of course, right there in the, in the short list of running mates for Mr. Trump is former candidate Newt Gingrich. Uh, many of us here know Newt. And I remember when he ran the last time, and it was kind of surprising because Sheldon Adelson, the billionaire, got behind him and kept his campaign going forward. And people would ask me, why did Sheldon Adelson get behind Newt Gingrich? And I said, it, it's obvious. He promised Sheldon that his next wife would be Jewish. <laughs> so we're down to the final two. And of course, we know in the general election that Donald Trump is going to paint Hillary Clinton as money grubbing, reckless, and unethical. And Hillary Clinton plans on uh, uh, painting Donald Trump as Donald Trump. Uh, now, Trump, uh, he's struggling a little bit financially in the campaign. A recent reports said his campaign even spent $100,000 for meals just last month. That's the price you pay, I guess, for hiring Chris Christie. Trump, uh, of course, bragged that he got the earliest endorsement ever from the National Rifle Association for president, which I guess goes to show that they take seriously their commitment to absolutely zero background checks. Now, <laughs> uh, Trump has gone on the attack against Clinton, and uh, last week it was against her religion. He said he didn't even know if she had a religion. Uh, Hillary Clinton said, actually, several times a day, she speaks to God, uh, just never for under $100,000. <laughs> Trump, of course, has put a lot of Republicans in a difficult spot. On the one hand, he's made a lot of offensive statements. On the other hand, Trump is his only party's chance of winning. And because of its Trump, both of those hands are very, very tiny. <laughs> it's a little difficult for him to reach out beyond the audience that he's picked, although uh, just the other day Trump said, I'm going to do really well with black voters. Look how well I did in West Virginia in the primary. Did you see those crowds? And then somebody pointed out to him they were actually coal miners. <laughs> There are so many Trump jokes, it's just hard to choose among them. But I do like to get you laughing because it's all downhill uh, from this point on. So I want to cover a little bit of ground here in, in a few areas. And there's so much to talk about, especially after this wrenching week that we've had. And the questions that so many Americans are raising now, uh, whether we're in a different time, whether this is something that we're going to be able to get out of, whether we're losing some essential parts of our own American identity, or we'll move into territory that we haven't seen uh, in most of our lifetimes. 
and it's worth pondering in a lot of ways. And it's true not just about the political system, but about the basic fabric of the society. So we'll see what we can cover in a short period of time and with the give and take that we have. I want to start first by reflecting some on the broader landscape of our politics and what I've seen in, in the changes now and over the last couple of decades that led me to believe almost a year ago, and I wrote it back uh, last August, that I thought the Republican nomination would come down to Trump and Cruz, uh, and why we are where we are uh, today. And I'll start with just a couple of terms that I think are important uh, to frame it, uh, and that really have a lot to do with where we are today, and those are angry populism and partisan tribalism. And let me reflect on both of them for a couple of minutes. The populism, of course, is all around us, and it's something we know is deeply embedded in the DNA of the United States, going back to the founding. Uh, you know, a good part of populism is a sense of distrust of elites, of those in positions of power. That's grounded in our fundamental philosophy. It's also something that we've seen emerging frequently throughout our history going back especially to that intense period surrounding Andrew Jackson in the 1820s. But every time we have difficulty, especially economic difficulty, populism emerges, and in the modern period it emerges in a fashion that brings with it a substantial share of nativism, protectionism, and isolationism. The last time we had angry populism that was a parallel to what we have today it was a different set of uh, events that triggered it. We didn't have the dramatic collapse that we saw in 2008. It was in the late 1980s and into the early 1990s when the economy was sluggish, but not in disastrous shape. But what triggered it as much as anything else was a pay raise for top public officials members of Congress, judges, top executive officials, in 1989. Now, we used to have what was called, awkwardly, a quadrennial commission. Basically, a collection of societal elites of all different types, from the business world, from the political world, from the labor world, education, religion, and the like, and they would get together every four years to decide what kind of pay increase should be there for these top officials. And in 1988, when they met, there hadn't been a raise for over a decade. And they decided that members of Congress were struggling, judges, we were having difficulty getting some to even consider it, moving out of the legal profession. And so they ought to make up for the decade with inflation alone, and that meant a 25% pay raise. That was supported by the outgoing president, Ronald Reagan, the incoming president, George Herbert Walker Bush, all congressional leaders, and the public exploded in anger. Most Americans said, I'm lucky if I get a 1% COLA. And they're getting 25%. They're already making $87,500 a year, and I'm making a third of that. And it was an outrage to people, combined with other incidents and scandals, and a press coverage that had surveys that suggested that a majority of Americans believed that members of Congress lived in mansions, had liveried servants, drove in limousines, and at the Capitol got five-star meals for free, had a spa that would be uh, welcome at any of the major resorts uh, around the country, and so on. And it triggered an enormous political reaction. Now, the year before, the Federal Communications Commission had repealed the Fairness Doctrine. And all of a sudden, radio and television changed. Talk radio changed. Rush Limbaugh had been a sports radio talk show host out in Southern California. And he moved to New York where they were gonna try and make something national, and the pay raise gave him the rocket to national prominence. And of course, what we saw in politics was 
a populist uprising on the left with Ralph Nader, on the right with Pat Buchanan, and in the angry center with Ross Perot. One of my more unpleasant experiences was going on the then CNN show Crossfire, uh, supporting the pay raise. And I was like the cream in the Oreo cookie between Ralph Nader and Pat Buchanan. And afterward, I had to take three showers, and it took me a week before I felt uh, the uh, uncleanliness removed, but they were saying exactly the same thing. And of course, you remember that in June of 1992, Ross Perot actually had led in the polls over the putative Democratic candidate Bill Clinton and the Republican incumbent George Herbert Walker Bush. Now, Perot had a set of themes that worked. And you could almost embody at least a couple of those populist themes, the nativism and the protectionism in that famous phrase, the giant sucking sound of jobs going down to Mexico. Now, after a while, Perot demonstrated to most Americans that his trade table wasn't in its full upright and locked position. <laughs> and his plurality of support declined. But remember, he still ended up with 19% of the votes. That's the power of populism in the country. The conspiracy of elites, the sense that they were feathering their own nests while the rest of us suffered. Now fast forward to the fall of 2008 the financial collapse, and all of the elites, the political elites, the financial elites, and others got together as George W. Bush, the president, and his treasury secretary, Hank Paulson, the chairman of the Fed, and all the previous chairs of the Fed, and almost every major figure, including all the leaders in Congress, stood up and said, we are on the verge of collapse. The global economy could sink into a depression that would make the 30s look mild by comparison. We're this close to a global credit freeze. We've got to take action now. And the result was the TARP program, the bailout. I would remind you that at a moment when everybody at the elite level said that the global economy is teetering at the abyss, their first effort failed in the House of Representatives because House Republicans said, why should we believe them? The populism was already there. The Dow dropped over 700 points. They regrouped and they passed it. But that led to an even greater spasm of angry populism on the left with the Occupy Wall Street movement, on the right with the Tea Party movement. And the fundamental attitude was those elites got together and they bailed out the miscreants who got us into this mess and then let them take bonuses. And what happened to us? We lost our houses. If we didn't lose our houses, they declined dramatically in value, and that's the asset most of us have to be able to give to our children or to use for retirement. We lost our jobs, or if we didn't lose our jobs, we got stuck in a dead end because our employers knew we weren't going anywhere and they could stick it to us over a period of time. And the reaction was fierce and long-lasting. It wasn't equal on both sides. The Occupy movement, I think pretty much befitting the left and the culture in a lot of ways, organized to Occupy. And they set up tents in a bunch of places across from Wall Street and elsewhere. And after a few weeks, they basically disbanded. They wanted to take showers. They didn't want to go to the porta-potties anymore. And not much came of it. The Tea Party movement was a grassroots movement, but it also organized, got candidates, and moved uh, into a political environment. And it really began to change the politics in Washington and elsewhere. And the rise of what we could call Trumpism, with its stark versions of protectionism and nativism, and a dash of isolationism, too. NATO, who needs NATO? They're not going to pay for it. We'll get out of it, among other things, really began to resonate. And I would say that what made Donald Trump's genius in figuring out where 
his own electorate was. You remember we had 17 candidates, and he had a whole bunch of people out there who you could have imagined emerging. You could have imagined Ben Carson, not a politician, a respected, uh, e uh, even held in awe neurosurgeon. You could have imagined a Ted Cruz. You could have imagined a businesswoman like Carly Fiorina. And Trump was sort of just one among that pack until he started to talk about the Mexican rapists coming in over the border and building the wall and making Mexico pay for it by getting to the right of all those other candidates on the immigration issue, which became a kind of catch-all for this angry populism. It enabled him to emerge uh, in a stronger position than he would have otherwise. Now, I also have to say that the anger that voters felt was there on both sides, and we saw it with the rise of Bernie Sanders, an unlikely candidate. And unlikely in a host of ways, in part because Sanders had never been a Democrat. <laughs> never. And not only had he never been a Democrat, the last time he ran for re-election for the Senate, very popular in Vermont, the Vermont Democratic Party said, we'd like to endorse you. They didn't want to put up just a sacrificial lamb. And he said, no, I don't even want your endorsement. And of course, Donald Trump has had as many party affiliations as he's had wives, <laughs> at least. And that will tell you something. The sense of being seduced and abandoned by the parties. But it's a bit of a paradox, because it also comes at a time when we are dominated by partisan tribalism. Now, we all know about the polarization, and everybody talks about polarization, and it's obvious, and it's there. It's clear that we've had a collapse of the center among the political elites, and it's happening more and more, although it's not quite there at the mass level. We know the roots of it. We know that in Congress, where we used to have a Democratic Party with a very strong even dominant base in the South that meant that there were Southern, rural, conservatives who were almost equal in number to the other Democrats who had a very different philosophy, and a Republican Party that had a strong base of moderates and liberals in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic region and some in the Midwest and very solidly down the West Coast, that all of that changed over several decades and that the parties, in effect, sorted themselves out ideologically in a way that they hadn't when many of us grew up in the 50s and into the 60s and even into the 70s. But I want to emphasize that polarization does not mean you can't work together to solve problems. One great example is that longtime odd couple of Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy, different in almost every respect you could imagine, their personal lifestyles, their politics, but they forged a deep and enduring friendship over decades that meant, among other things, that we have a children's health insurance program because the two of them worked together. We got an earlier version of criminal justice reform because they were able to do it. You could look at Henry Waxman, 40 years in the House of Representatives, from 1974, until 2014, nobody, including Henry, would say he was a moderate, he was a liberal, but his fingerprints were all over every piece of health, environmental, and other social policy over that 40-year period, and his biggest advances, he would say, and it's accurate, came when Ronald Reagan was president. They figured out how to work together. What's changed in the last two decades, and especially in the last several years, is that we've gone from simple polarization to tribalism. Tribalism is where, in effect, you say, if you're for it, I'm against it, even if I was for it yesterday. And now, the idea of working with people on the other side is anathema. There's nothing positive that comes from it. And I could go into chapter and verse the chapter and verse are there in the book, which makes a great holiday gift. <laughs> Did I mention that? Uh, but I won't. Just to say that while this happened and started in Washington, 
It's metastasized out to the states and now very much in a way that's quite disturbing to the public as a whole. We now have a lot of research that suggests that Americans are partisan, but they are driven more by negative partisanship than they are by the attachment to their own party. People vote more because the other side is the enemy now, not just the worthy adversary. And you've got to keep them from any power. And we know as well that it's affected things in a cultural fashion. So back in the early 1960s, there was a major survey that asked people how they would feel if a child of theirs married somebody from another religion, another race, or the other party. <laughs> the other party, four or five percent said they'd be upset. Now, more Americans would be upset if a child of theirs married somebody from the other party than from another religion, and it's just about even on race. Now, you could say that's progress, <laughs> but it has a serious downside to it, and it's getting worse. And so, to some degree, you've got that strong partisanship, and we see the parties behaving, behaving almost like parliamentary parties. But at the same time, you've got strong groups on both sides who are willing to go for nominees who have nothing to do with the party. It's an interesting and not entirely edifying tension that we have out there in the system. All of this, Trump aside, has made it extraordinarily challenging to govern. And you could look at the whole range of examples, but just to pick one for a moment, when the Affordable Care Act was passed and enacted. It was done with one party voting entirely against it and the other party voting entirely for it. And we've had instances in the past where there are sharp partisan divisions over social policy. We had it not with the same starkness with Social Security with Medicare. We had it with Medicare Part D, the pres prescription drug benefit when uh, George W. Bush was president. But in every instance in the past when we've enacted policies, we come back the next year or the year after and make an adjustment. Once they're law, we usually make a technical adjustment because anytime there's a major policy, you're going to have some mistakes, you're going to have some things that don't work. You're also going to have unintended consequences. And we always adjust. This time, a classic example of tribalism, no adjustment. Instead, it's votes to repeal. And the inability to adjust is creating enormous perturbations out there that create consequences for all kinds of people. You may like it, you may not like it. But once it's there, you want to make it work. And we're no longer in a mindset to be able to make policies work. We used to be able as well to make some distinction between foreign policy and domestic policy, those distinctions are gone now as well. All of that leaves us with a real set of challenges. Now, it's a set of challenges that are made greater at the moment because we have, not only do we have presidential candidates who look through a partisan prism to start with, are disliked more than other candidates that we've seen before. What we've also seen over the last 20 years is we used to have a situation where presidential approval, there was always a difference between how the partisans of the president viewed that individual and how the other party did, but the gap was about like this. Now it's like this. People from the opposite party just almost reflexively dislike and disapprove of the president and you get the opposite reaction. Now we have something a little bit different, which puts Trump on a different scale, because of course it's a division within the Republican Party as well as one that divides the two parties. But it also has given us with that angry populism a candidate for president who is unlike any that we have seen at least in this century and perhaps going back even further. A candidate not only the only one that we've had in a major party with no experience 
in politics or governance, but also one who is almost proud of the reality that he doesn't know anything about most areas of public policy. <laughs> I've said in the past, uh, and not really joking about it, that in 50 years of watching presidential politics closely, I've never seen a candidate with less fundamental knowledge of public policy, and that includes Pat Paulson, who ran <laughs> as a comedian. But however the presidential election comes out, we've had enough of a breakdown in the political system, and one that's going to continue to deepen, that the basics of governance are going to be enormously challenging. Just look at us right now. We knew six months ago that there was a strong potential for the Zika virus to spread significantly enough in the country that it could cause real problems. Problems that would go beyond pregnant women ending up with children with microencephaly, but also triggering the equivalent of Guillain-Barre disease and other serious problems. The Centers for Disease Control came out months ago with a detailed plan on how to prevent this, asking for $1.8 billion. Months ago, the summer season, obviously, when it's much worse. Congress has not done anything, and they are poised to go away for most of the summer without having done anything. If that isn't a measure of functionality or dysfunctionality in a political system, Zika is not a partisan or an ideological issue. The mosquitoes don't ask if you're a Democrat or a Republican. They don't ask if you're a liberal or a conservative. They bite when they have the targets. And the consequences are significant for the society. If you can't even do that, what are we going to do when we have much larger challenges? And those larger challenges in a world where we have asymmetric risks and threats and no easy way to deal with them, where we have instability and difficulty not just in the Middle East, but in Europe and Asia now of enormous significance, where we have to figure out how we can compete in a global economy, which no matter how much we shout, is going to still be a global economy, not one where we can shut off the borders, shut off trade, or not face the consequences of other countries faltering for our own lives and our own economies. And here we have I think challenges on both sides, but a particularly strong challenge on the Republican side because what we've seen in the Republican presidential nominating contest is in some ways a microcosm of a party falling apart and suffering a deep identity crisis. Something that we have seen in Congress and we've seen at the presidential level. And one of the reasons I saw it coming back a year ago was every early poll of all Republicans or of the most active Republicans showed that 60 to 70 percent wanted an outsider or an insurgent and only 20 percent wanted an establishment figure. On the Republican side, the party establishment, including the leaders in Congress, have done almost everything they could to separate themselves out from their own partisan base and to create a deeper division and a set of expectations that were not going to be met about how they were going to deal with policy or how they were going to deal with Barack Obama. And whatever happens with Donald Trump, and certainly if he loses, the divisions within the party are going to be deep and enduring. And you've got a Trumpist populist faction, and I can tell you whether Trump loses narrowly or loses in a landslide. He and that base of people who are ardent supporters of his are going to believe that they've lost because they've been stabbed in the back by their own party establishment and it's time to take over and take the party back for the people. And you're going to have a purist wing, the Ted Cruz, Tom Cotton, Freedom Caucus wing, 
that believes that they lost because for the third time in a row, they picked a moderate or a liberal, John McCain, Mitt Romney, and now Donald Trump. And if only we could enforce that ideological purity, then we'd get all those voters who stayed out of it, the silent majority emerging, the old Goldwater thesis brought back to life. And you've got a party establishment that is the weakest of the three links right now, trying to figure out how to operate and one thing we can be sure of is that the next Congress is going to have relatively greater strength for the Freedom Caucus purist wing and a much greater challenge for party leaders like Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell. And remember, we now live in a political world where when Donald Trump campaigning in the Wisconsin primary, just outside of Janesville, Paul Ryan's home, said to this large crowd, much larger, said, what do you think of your Paul Ryan? And there was a chorus of boos and people chanting, Paul Rhino. Now, if Paul Ryan, the most conservative speaker in the history of the country, is a Republican in name only, that's a pretty scary thought. Because that's a party that has moved from conservative to radical, at least with a substantial core of people. And with all of this, we have another force, the apocalyptic tribal media. The Laura Ingrams and Mark Levins and Glenn Becks of the world who thrive and make money by saying the apocalypse is right around the corner and by trashing their own party's establishment as much as they do the other party. If you watch some of those television shows or listen to the radio shows, what you'll hear more than anything else is gold commercials. <laughs> Why gold? We know. The apocalypse is coming. Buy that gold. It's the only thing that will matter. And that makes the challenge of an establishment to come back to an establishment that will be a problem-solving party much, much more difficult. Now, Democrats should take no comfort from having a Republican Party going through this crisis. And I'll talk in a minute about the Democrats' own challenges. Because the fact is, our political system will not function for long unless there are two vibrant, problem-solving parties. The Republican Party is not going to be the party of Eisenhower or the party of Nixon or even the party of Reagan. It's going to be a more conservative party. But if it isn't a conservative problem-solving party that can figure out how, within the context of a political system that's not a parliamentary one, and a culture that requires broad leadership consensus to make Americans feel that the policies that are enacted, that after all, shake up our lives, are legitimate. If we don't have that, we're going to face a much deeper challenge for our children and grandchildren down the road. Now the second problem is one that we've seen emerge and become even deeper this last week, which is a serious breakdown in societal cohesion. And I'll tell you one of the things that happens in this modern era with the populism that we see, with the tribal and social media, the modern media that we have. Many of you, I'm sure, going back to college days, read books by the historian Richard Hofstadter about the underbelly in American culture that's been there also since the beginning. But it tended to be atomized and isolated with small groups. Now, there's no more atomization. And you can have a more popular political movement, and people who used to be left off the train can figure out how to get on and even move into the first-class compartment now. And what we're seeing is an ugliness on race and religion that is very difficult to deal with and a legitimacy given to words and policies that should not be legitimized. And I want to say this is a much broader problem than in politics. Our culture overall has been coarsened. You don't have to be a prude to look out there and when you see a world in which there is a cacophony of voices, no longer free networks that provide the information that you get 
a morning and afternoon newspaper that supplement them, a news magazine once a week for all of us who are junkies about what's going on in the world, millions and millions of places to turn. And how do you cut through that? You need shock value. The more shocking, the more attention you're going to get. And at the same time, we now live in a world where you're one click away from the most vile pornography that anybody could imagine. One click away from the most awful, disgusting violence that you could have. And that's deadened us, I think, and we've lost a sense of shame. And you put those things together and then add in the reality that after the economic shock of 2008 and 2009, with the nature of a global economy where jobs are not working the way that we wanted them to and the way that you could expect to and where the old rules that if you played by the rules and you got this education and you did the training, you'd be safe. Those don't work anymore. And we live in a world, in a country, where inexorably, by 2% every year, we are moving towards a majority of minorities in America. And you throw in the inequality. All of that. And it's creating divisions that are enormously challenging, not just in politics, but in the society more broadly. And if you've looked at some of these surveys recently, Pew and others, where white Americans believe that there is tremendous racism against them. And the views of how we're treated in the society, not just by police, but more broadly, of the races are just dramatically different. And you see the way we're reacting, including in tribal fashion, just flip back and forth across networks to the horrors of the last week. And then consider that if you take partisan tribalism and the sense that people on the other side are no longer adversaries but the enemy, and you move towards a period where, thanks in significant part to Donald Trump, although not only Donald Trump, the Republican Party has thrown out the old autopsy that Reince Priebus put together. Not a very good term for uh, what you want a party to turn to, but one that said if we don't broaden our base, we're going to become a permanent minority. And you've got a party that is striving at this point to become an all-white party. And you have a Democratic party hemorrhaging among white working class voters that's becoming predominantly a party of minorities. You lay a race on top of party, and it is a, an explosive uh, dynamic. Now, the Democratic Party has its own challenges, as Bernie Sanders has pointed out. But there's one area where I think our challenge becomes particularly asymmetric, which we saw, have seen in many surveys, but a new one that National Journal just put out uh, this past week. And that is when people are asked the question, do you think that our politicians should compromise so that they can solve problems or should stand firm on principle even if nothing happens? Democrats favor compromise. Oddly, those who identify as liberals favor it more than those who identify as moderates, and I can't quite get my arms around that. And Republicans, by a very different margin, it's two to one for Democrats, two to one almost for Republicans, say, stand on principle even if it means nothing gets done. Our political system doesn't work if we don't compromise. And if we have politicians who look out there at the landscape and decide to exploit these fears and divisions, and we have not just a tribal apocalyptic media, but a mainstream media trying to figure out how to survive when the business models have changed, we're going to be in trouble. And I thought it particularly striking the other night, a former congressman named Joe Walsh, after Dallas, uh, tweeted that we're in the middle of a war and we're coming after you, Barack Obama. It was a direct threat to the President of the United States, and a shocking one. And what happens the next day? He gets a 15-minute primetime interview on CNN. 
And I'm thinking, if I'm out there wondering how I could get a 15-minute primetime interview on CNN, now I know. And one of the things that we have to do, I believe, as a people, is to figure out how we can reinstall a sense of shame when individuals, whoever it may be, step over a line and do something that should not be acceptable, we make sure that there's an understanding that it's unacceptable and there are no rewards for it, and we come down hard on media outlets that basically legitimize instead of shunning those kinds of behaviors. A small step. More broadly, I'll just say in a couple of minutes, our biggest challenge is not that our structures are faulty. Our political system is always going to struggle in a modern era with a large government and the need to act often swiftly in a political system designed not to. But we can't simply throw that away and go to, a, say, a parliamentary culture, and it's not as if that's so much better. Look at all the European countries' parliamentary systems who've kept doing stupid things over and over again. They can act. They act stupidly. And our culture doesn't support that in any case. But until we change our culture, the structures are not going to be able to function the way they're supposed to. And yet with that, how do you change a culture? You have to begin by changing some of the structures. We've got to change the political money system, which adds on another layer of corruption and will make most Americans feel even more that the system is stacked against them when a small group of extraordinarily wealthy people dominate the process, choose the candidates, and get the access, and tilt the system in a fashion that means that those who want to solve problems are going to look at getting into politics and say, no way, who needs that? We have got to change the districting process. It's not a panacea. The biggest problem we have is more and more Americans are engaging in what the journalist Bill Bishop called the big sort. We're moving into areas where we're surrounded by like-minded people. And redistricting that gives us smaller compact districts may worsen that problem, not make it better. But if we exist in a political system where the politicians choose the voters instead of the voters choosing the politicians, that's going to add to the illegitimacy. And if we have more and more districts that are homogeneous in nature and become homogeneous echo chambers, because that's how the world of communications works now. People reinforce their own views with what they listen and read and uh, hear uh, and watch and what their friends and relatives send them uh, in uh, emails and other social media and live in a world where the political forces know that the best way to succeed is to basically uh, encourage and enable the most extreme among us. If we don't move away from that and create more of a sense of heterogeneity, politicians representing wide ranges of people, we're going to be in big trouble. If we don't enlarge the electorate so that we don't have our elections dominated by smaller groups who tend to be the most ardent, and generally that means the most extreme in both parties, then we may not get out of this for a very long time. Now I'll end first by saying, of course, if you look at the long sweep of history, of American history, we've been here before. We've had many eras of enormous challenge, eras of societal breakdown, eras from the 1820s with Jackson up through the period that led to the Civil War, the 1890s, when you actually had a Democratic Party that went off the rails with William Jennings Bryan, and the populism of that era reverberated for a very long time uh, in its aftermath, uh, up through the 1960s and 1970s, the anti-war era, and some of the consequences that flowed from that. And generally speaking, it's taken 10 or 15 years to come back. I'm not sure we have 10 or 15 years without doing untold damage. And there's no easy way out, no easy path, but it's incumbent on all of us 
to do what we can to begin to shift the culture back to a point where there's value in problem solving and not in the opposite. And just to end on an upbeat note, my book's selling very well. <laughs> And time for questions. Yes, time, for que time for questions, so send your questions in. The ushers will be around to collect them. And I'll begin by saying, you, com you commented on the money system. Citizens United, United contributed to this. What would it take to reverse that, and is that a possibility? That's a very good question, and I, I will say, um, I do believe that Citizens United was one of the worst and worst reasoned decisions that I have ever seen. It's not just Citizens United. That was followed very quickly by an appeals court decision called Speech Now that basically gave us the super PACs. And by another decision that's even more troubling called McCutcheon, in which uh, the Chief Justice, John Roberts, basically said, in effect, the only corruption that exists is of the ab scam or American hustle variety. It's not corruption unless you capture a direct quid pro quo bribe on videotape. Otherwise, money for access, that's the American way. And I reject that, and I think uh, a lot of others do too. But how do you change it? There are some things you could do in the short run. It's unfortunate that we didn't get a law that mandated disclosure, because it's the dark money as much as anything else that's troubling. And there's an, a classic example of tribalism. In the aftermath of Citizens United, the House of Representatives passed something called the Disclose Act that would have provided disclosure for all these different entities, and it got 59 votes in the Senate. Not a single Republican, including John McCain, who had sponsored the law, Olympia Snow, who had written the relevant amendment, voted for it because it became tribal. So there's that. We could empower small donors in a variety of ways. The most modest, it's not modest, would be to have a five or six to one matching fund for small donations for candidates who got over a threshold of support. They do this in New York City and it actually works to provide real incentives to get small donations. The bold way is something that they're trying now in Seattle, which is Patriot dollars. Everybody gets a voucher worth $25, every voter and you can use it to give to any candidate of your choice. If you don't want to use it, you can just give it back. There's no market in them. You have an enormous sum of money out there that would, in fact, tilt the system away from the billionaires. In the long run, we're going to need a different court, and you're going to need a new theory to create a very different campaign money system, and that's probably five to ten years off if we're lucky. I have two questions here that go together. You ripped apart Trump. Do you feel that Hillary is clean? And the second one is, the second one is you never talked about Clinton and her lies about the emails. Please address this. So, is Hillary clean? I bet she took a shower this morning. But is she clean in terms of the way in which she's dealt with her finances or the finances of the foundation, I think there is an enormous amount of sloppiness and a lack of, I think, fundamental concern for or understanding of the consequences of some actions. Some of it I understand in a way. Decades of both public scrutiny and being beaten on, but it's no excuse for a blindness of creating an email system the way in which it was done. Having said that, I've talked to a lot of people who are very much involved with uh, security and classification, and not one who was neutral in this fashion said that there was any chance of an indictment given the way the classification system works. And I will say on that front, one of the things that disappoints me is you would hope we would use this as a vehicle to deal with two really big problems out there 
that transcend whatever misbehavior or bad behavior she engaged in that are much larger issues. One, and many of you I know worked in the federal government, the information technology in the federal government is a catastrophe. And that's true across the board, and it's even more true in the areas of national security. And what that's meant is, in the State Department, for decades, they've all done workarounds. Not on that scale, and it's different if you're the Secretary of State, but if we don't get the information technology of the federal government up to a standard that we have more broadly, and that includes cybersecurity, then we're going to have much bigger problems on our hands. And frankly, if you think about a world where it's now, you know, we're past the recruitment season in Silicon Valley. So just imagine all these incredibly bright electrical engineers and uh, computer scientists coming out of Stanford, and they got booths for Intel and Cisco and Facebook, and they're offering them huge packages. And then you've got the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Defense Department, the CIA, and they're saying to the same people, you know what, we can give you, we can give you a pay freeze for three years, probably five. We can't tell you exactly when you're going to get the job. It may be six months or a year, you'll just have to wait. Relocation expenses, sorry, there's none of that. That's a bigger problem. It doesn't have anything to do with or excuse what Hillary Clinton did. And if Hillary Clinton gets elected, She's got a big challenge, obviously, in a deeply divided country to begin with, and a tribal country, but also a country where the level of trust for her is way too low to be able to govern effectively. That's a challenge that both have, uh, and an undeniable one. Uh, I would just say very briefly, the, uh, the second issue is the broader one of classification. Any of you who've been around government know that we classify in crazy fashion. And most of those emails that are top secret, not all, but most, involved mentions often in newspaper articles of the word drone. Because the CIA will not acknowledge that there is a drone program. And anything that says it in an official document, even if it is basically sending a New York Times piece is top secret. That's sort of nuts. And not to mention the fact that a lot of things are marked secret because they're embarrassing. So those are bigger issues that we need to deal with that don't excuse any of the other stuff, but we're not in a political situation to even begin to deal with them the way we should. This is a little bit related. With both major candidates polling so low, what percentage of voters do you see voting for the Green Party or the Libertarian Party? So recall that uh, we had that 19% for Perot in 1992. We had 9% for John Anderson in 1980. We had 13.5% for George Wallace in 1968. We've had many instances where candidates who are not of the two major parties, have done fairly well, sometimes regionally, sometimes out of dissatisfaction with the two major party candidates. It wouldn't at all be surprising to see numbers at least combined for the Green Party and the Libertarian Party in the double digits this time, and maybe even a little bit higher. But remember, when you see polls that include them now, almost inevitably what happens is those numbers in the summer or the early fall are the high watermark. Over time, people tend to come back to those major parties. And it's going to be a very interesting challenge to see how that plays out this time. If you look at most of the surveys now, the, even before uh, Bernie Sanders uh, more or less conceded, uh, the numbers of Democrats who were Sanders supporters saying they were going to vote for Clinton was 86 to 9 who said that they wouldn't. The number of Republicans who said they're not going to vote is greater than that. And I suspect there'll be some who might go to a libertarian candidate. There may be a few who'll vote for Hillary Clinton. I think a lot of them are just not going to vote for president. 
Given Newt Gingrich's role in promoting the dysfunction in Congress, what would you think of him as a Trump vice presidential choice? As somebody who writes about these things, I'd love it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you could see reasons why <clears throat> Trump would uh, pick Newt, uh, Newt Gingrich. Newt has been an ardent supporter of his for some time. Newt wants it, and there are a lot of people he is considering who are, shall we say, ambivalent uh, about it. Newt has great experience as a debater. Newt has all those years in Congress, uh, 20 uh, years uh, in the body, and of course a period of time as Speaker. Newt knows a lot about public policy. Newt's a very smart guy, but Newt also brings an enormous amount of baggage with him. It's not just the personal baggage, although there's a lot of personal baggage. It's also that while he brilliantly figured out a way to bring his party out of 40 years of wandering in the desert of the minority to the promised land in 1994. As speaker, he didn't do very well. And he was pretty much pushed out after four years, even though his party was able to keep that majority. He's not particularly well liked by the leaders who are there now. The idea that Newt would be an emissary to Congress, I think, is uh, a little bit uh, of a stretch. Uh, so if you're looking at this objectively as Trump in terms of what he might want in a nominee, there's a lot of downside to it. Uh, but that's true of almost all of the people he's considering right now. You didn't discuss the effect of terrorist attacks on the American political decisions. In Europe, these attacks seem to be pushing people toward racism. How much of an impact do you think attacks like the one in Orlando have on American voters? We have a lot of uncertainty in our politics over the next few months. Start with Brexit, which is bringing economic uncertainty. We don't know where all of that will go. One of my colleagues has suggested that Italy may be the next Greece before the election and that there could be a lot of consequences and we might feel them here. And then you've got terrorist attacks that may be well-organized ones or may be single individuals. And as we saw in Orlando and as we saw in Dallas, remember for most of that gripping evening, we thought that there was a team of people, four or five, shooting from different places. And it turns out one guy was able to inflict that damage. So we could have a lot of them. And you could have multiple ones around the country. And that could bring a sense of panic. And that could affect our politics. And it could affect it, obviously, in a racial fashion. Now, we don't know a whole lot yet about this terrible person who killed five police officers in Dallas. But we know that he served in the military. He was a troubled person. He had affiliated himself with radical black organizations. And it may, he clearly been planning this for some time. But the trigger to operate now may well have been the two terrible incidents in Baton Rouge and St. Paul. And we know the reaction that we get from something like Orlando, where there may be multiple motives, but where there's clearly at least some tie to Al-Qaeda or terrorist organizations or ISIS or other entities. Get a lot of those around the country, and first there might be a sense of panic, and that could affect people's political choices. You can imagine it going in either direction. You could imagine it being, we better take the gamble with the strong man, or we can't take any risks right now. And at the same time, the reaction with a racial division could be very, very great. Dallas was so unfortunate in so many ways because Dallas has a model police department that has done all the things you want a police department to do to try and build confidence across the different communities there. And that march 
was a model march where the police were interacting with and working with the protesters. And then in the end, we saw the protesters try to protect the police. But that's not how it's being viewed out there more broadly. And it gets back to what I was saying earlier. You know, terrorist attacks or not, this sense of people looking at the world through a completely different prisms that add to that racial divide and get reinforced by modern media and social media is really something that we have to tackle as a society. We are not immune from the kind of sectarian division that we've seen elsewhere in the world. And we don't want to have it emerge in a fashion where it's not the equivalent of the last civil war, but where it becomes something that is really enduringly, deeply divisive for us. How do you see the Republican convention progressing? Violence in the streets or lemmings over the cliff? <laughs> you know, it's going to be very interesting inside the convention because I think Trump is extraordinarily good at creating uh, an event. And I'm not sure how it's going to go, although, you know, it's interesting when you decide that the people you're going to showcase include Mike Tyson, best known for biting somebody's ear off and serving time in prison, uh, and uh, uh, a basketball coach, Bobby Knight, uh, known for throwing a chair. I actually thought maybe what he ought to do is have Bobby Knight throw the chair and whoever catches it can become the vice president. Uh, uh, but my guess is that Despite all of the moves, the never Trump move, the attempt to take the nomination away from him, the attempt to choose their own vice presidential nominee, that it'll probably be fairly smooth inside the convention hall. Outside is a different matter, and it gets back to the last question. You're going to have a lot of professional agitators, left-wing professional agitators, white supremacists showing up looking for bloodshed and confrontation. Sacramento had a terrible incident where seven white supremacists were stabbed. And the leader of that movement was giddy. It was the best thing that had ever happened to them because they were victims and they got attention for it. And I'm really worried that we're going to have significant violence on the streets in Cleveland. And the Cleveland police force is about as well prepared for that as the Chicago police force, <laughs> which is not where you want to be. Is there any chance of changing the Senate filibuster rules? If not, how can the confirmation of judges and federal officials be speeded up? And related to that, if a Democratic president is elected, do you think Merrick Garland's nomination will go forward? So, the, you know, the fact that uh, Merrick Garland isn't even getting a hearing uh, is another example of the tribal dysfunction that we have. And, you know, it's not, uh, let's not even talk about whether the Republican Senate would confirm a Merrick Garland. That within an hour of the announcement of Justice Scalia's untimely death, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said, we're not even going to have a hearing. Tells you something about who's sort of dominating the process out here. Because, you know, the logical thing to do politically and in public relations terms more generally would be to say, we're going to follow the regular order, we'll have a nomination, we'll hold a hearing, and we'll vote him down. Uh, that's fine because we want to wait till the next president. Not even holding a hearing it basically suggests that you're speaking to a smaller group. And that's a problem now. Now we know that with the tensions that have been there for a long time, with the parties seeing the courts, when you have political dysfunction and you can't enact policy, or you know, because one of the reasons we have the tribalism is we have highly competitive politics now. Each party knows that a little bit here, a little bit there, you could win the next election. You could win the House, you could win the Senate, you could win the White House. The stakes become higher and it becomes more tempting to try and excite your own base and suppress the other side's base. But you also know under those circumstances where power 
may alternate at different times, that if you can dominate the courts, you can keep your power, or at least a share of it, for decades after you're out of office. And we live in a world where for several decades before we hit this deeper dysfunction, when Congress couldn't reach agreement on difficult or divisive or politically challenging issues, they would pass the buck to the courts. They let the courts make those decisions. Then they could you know, criticize them afterward. I used to call it passing the buck and pointing the finger. But that meant more power for courts over policy. And so now the stakes are much higher. And because of that, we got the change in the filibuster rules the last time that eliminated filibusters on judges at the district and appeals court level, but not the Supreme Court. And if, let's say we end up with a scenario, just to pick one, where Hillary Clinton wins, Democrats win a narrow majority in the Senate, and Republicans filibuster any nominee, Merrick Garland or somebody Hillary Clinton picks to replace Merrick Garland. My guess is if that went on for six or nine months, that you would see another change in the filibuster rule that would reduce the margin for a Supreme Court nominee to a simple majority. I don't think that's a very good idea, but the problem, and here you get to it, the filibuster rule operated without change from 1975 until a year ago. And there were in instances of headaches, but it worked reasonably well, and you could argue that it had a positive effect in some sense that because at times when you had major national issues, you might need 60 votes, you had to reach across the aisle. But when the norms changed and the culture changed and it began to be used simply to obstruct things, minor issues, major issues, nominees who are not controversial, along with those who were, then you had to change the rule in some fashion. And what I would do if I were going to change the rule more broadly, right now the burden is on the majority to get to 60 votes. And if you have 60 of your own party members and one gets sick, you're out of luck. The burden should be on the minority. If you feel intensely about something, you should be the ones who have to show up over and over again. So instead of requiring 60 to end debate, I would require 40 to continue debate. Make them have to show up over and over again whoever is in the majority and whoever has the White House. Now, when it comes to Merrick Garland, we've already had Jeff Flake, among others, uh, senator from Arizona, say, well, you know, uh, if uh, Clinton wins, we'll rush to confirm Merrick Garland because Hillary Clinton would pick somebody much more liberal. And they might try and do that in a lame duck session, although there'll still be pushback from many forces within the party. But we have no idea whether Barack Obama, under those circumstances, would say, I'm going to keep Garland's nomination out there, or might say, you know what, Clinton is the uh, uh, president-elect, uh, I'm going to withdraw this nomination and let her pick her own choice, and she might pick Merrick Garland, who is a wonderful judge and would be a superb justice, or she might go for somebody else. And we have no idea how that would play out, except we do know that it's now deeply ingrained in the culture of the Senate that whichever party doesn't have the White House wants to preserve the slots on the court, however qualified the nominees are, and that includes the appeals courts, as long as they possibly can. And that's a very different culture than we used to have, where it was almost automatic that if a president picks somebody who was qualified, automatically confirmed. Now, it has nothing to do with qualifications. It's who has the slot. We have more good questions, but I don't want to keep our speaker working too long. He has to go sign books. So I'll do two more. Uh, the first one is, is there a generational difference in the tribalism or isolationist perspective? I, you know, yes, in a sense. The members who've been there for a longer period of time and have a, different, uh, have a broader perspective I tend to have a little more of a tie to the institution. I will say, though, that one of the biggest problems that I see, and this cuts across all the party lines, uh, Steve Hoffman, who's here and who I've known for many years and worked in Congress uh, for many years, we used to have a lot of friends, members in both parties, who cared about their own institutions 
and cared about the process of governing. And you get very few people coming in who want to devote any time or attention to the maintenance of their own institutions or put themselves out in a fashion for broader considerations. Everybody's now getting caught up in a more tribal environment. But it's worse for the, the newer members. And when I look at the farm systems out there, I look at what we see in many state legislatures, it's even worse yet. So we used to be able to say, you know, all it takes is a crisis. A 9-11 will bring us back to some uh, unity again. I'm just not sure about that anymore. And I worry that unless we change the incentives for people coming into these institutions, change the mindset that uh, we're not going to be able to see a younger generation, which is obviously very different across ideology now when it comes to many of the social issues. Maybe the encouraging thing is we don't see those same levels of racial division for younger people. We certainly don't see it with many of the other social issues. Uh, but when it comes to dealing with tribalism and politics, we're not there yet. And the last question, do you have a recommendation for media outlets or a method of consuming media that ensures heterogeneity? That's a tough one. And I will tell you, I have, I, I have a growing contempt for all cable news outlets. I can't watch any of them for more than 15 minutes uh, at a time. They're all pandering to the worst instincts. They're bringing in people they shouldn't bring in and uh, showcasing uh, things that they shouldn't showcase. And I understand the economic imperatives for breaking news, but it's really hard to find a place where you can go and feel comfortable. Um, certainly, if you want to look for international news, the old stalwart of the BBC is there. Uh, but also, I will tell you, I think the best news analysis, period, is the Friday News Roundup, two hours done by Diane Rehm. One hour with four journalists who actually get in depth and try and step back uh, on domestic affairs, one hour on international affairs, and it's really, really good uh, every Friday. And then there's public media. More generally, they tend to be better. They're not perfect by any stretch. Uh, and what I'd like to do, if I could have my druthers in this uh, area, I want to recreate a public square. We used to have a public square. We shared a common set of facts, and we could debate intensely about the direction of policy. It was far from perfect. Those three networks, the newspapers, you know, they decided what issues we would talk about. And they sanitized plenty of things, including racial divisions, hunger, many issues for a long period of time. But there was a common place we could go. And now it doesn't exist. And you can bring it back, and it doesn't mean that people are going to go there, because we're more comfortable now going to where we want to go. But if I could do anything, it would be to take the public airwaves, which for decades have had this presumed uh, trade-off that you perform in the public interest and you get these extraordinarily lucrative free public airwaves. And I would say, never mind the public interest obligations because they don't do them anyhow. Uh, and you'll pay a rental fee for the spectrum. And we'll take that rental fee and we will put it into a public-private foundation that will try and do, mostly with public media but in other places, real discourse in a civil fashion and if we build it, I think at least some more people will come. In the absence of that, you know, we're all pretty much on our own. And for people like most of us, there's a wonderful aspect to it. I can sit at my desk and have access to more information at my fingertips than the entire United States government, including the defense establishment, NASA, and others had 40 years ago. I got more information on my phone than NASA had when we were starting. It's true that we were starting to work towards putting somebody on the moon. And I can find out anything that I want whenever I want, which makes barroom arguments really difficult. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Google, for that. But it also means we live in a world where trying to find 
sources we can trust that aren't just parroting what we already believe, or getting a kind of discourse, and by civil discourse, I don't mean intense discussion and debate, but I mean starting with a common set of facts and then working towards an understanding of what the difficulties are and what the trade-offs are and what happens if we move in particular directions, it's increasingly hard to do. And the public media are starting to falter because they don't have the audience uh, and they don't have the resources. And uh, maybe that means that we're never going to be able to find that again because it's an older audience or it's either a six-year-old audience watching Sesame Street or it's a 65-year-old audience watching The News Hour or Charlie Rose. Finding a way to grip people in between was something that will give them more, but also an even greater challenge. Finding a way so that we share common facts. Because if you don't share the facts to begin with, you can't even begin to have the debate and deliberation that is the absolute fundament of what the framers built into our political system. And that's a challenge that goes way beyond politics to what you do in a modern age of technology when you can get what you want, when you want, and not have to deal with anything that you don't want. Thank you very much.